call this meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors to order. We are here with the joint meeting with the Williamsburg City Council and the WJCC School Board. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Porter, if you'll call the roll. Yes. Ms. Sadler? Here. Mr. Hippel? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. All present. Thank you. Mayor Filey? The March 16, 2018 meeting of the Williamsburg City Council will come to order. Uh, Mr. Trivet, would you call the roll, please? Here. 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 Chair Cook. I'd like to call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Ms. Sosa, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Present. Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. I'd like to note that Mr. Kelly and Mrs. Taylor are not able to join us this morning because of work obligations, but they send their regards. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is the state budget issues and implications for K-12 public education in the WJCC School District. And we're going to hear from a speaker this morning, and that is Jim Regibal. And Mr. Regibal has 30 years of experience in state and local budget and tax policy analysis. He served for 12 years on the staff of the Virginia Senate Finance Committee from 1987 to 1999 where he provided the committee with expertise in tax, tax policy, transportation, and finance agency budgets, and economic and revenue forecasting. In 1999, he co-founded Fiscal Anal Analytics Limited, excuse me, where his expertise in state and local budget and tax policy issues have been provided to local governments, business groups, trade associations, and nonprofit organizations the Virginia Municipal League, the Virginia Association of Counties, and the Virginia First Cities Coalition currently employ his services. I have heard you speak many times at VSBA and look forward to your presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, kind of introduction. Um, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> this kind of introduction. So I've made a lot of these kinds of presentations, uh, not as much to uh, local government groups, but some. And uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. I hope it's informative. Uh, to you, I understand that what you'd really like to see is sort of the bigger picture, and then how, how your school district fits into that bigger picture. Um, so the state provides you about a third of your funding, so state funding is important, and there's a couple aspects to that, you know, how they build the, uh, the, um, the standards of quality and the incentive and categorical funds, and then how that's, a, how that's distributed to you through the composite index. So we'll, I'll talk about some of that as well. But what I'd first like to do is um, sort of set the stage for this state funding side of things by, by giving you an overview of sort of the, the situation the state is in right now, okay? So let's, let's uh, whoops, I'm gonna have to get used to this. Um, what I first wanna show you, and I see you don't have it in front of you, so we're gonna just focus in on, on uh, the slideshow here. Um, this shows you sort of the growth rates in state general fund revenues, which is what's primarily used to fund the state share of, of K-12. Uh, lottery funds, you can throw that in. That's about 550 to 600 million on, on top of that per year of general funds. Uh, but it's mainly general funds that are used of the, the six to seven billion dollars. So it's important to know what, how, how the state general fund is growing. And so you can see we used to get almost 6% growth. Now part of that was inflation, but part of that was really good growth for the state of Virginia. You know, we were growing rapidly with defense spending increases. The federal government provides a lot of stimulus through, its, through uh, you know, where we lie and how much we provide to the federal government in terms of, of Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. And that slowed considerably after the recession. Defense spending for five years in a row was flat or negative, for example. So that was, that's reflected in here. And I think we're coming out of that to a certain degree. You know, we, we don't, we're, uh, sequestration apparently is not going to be on the table. Um, so that's a positive. The, the, you know, the United States economy has been growing. We've got some stimulus going on. Now, I don't have a crystal ball out, you know, two, three years, how things might be impacted on the economy. But I think in the near term, uh, things, are, things are looking pretty good. They've forecasted very conservatively. And the budget hasn't been adopted, but they've decided this year not to increase the revenue forecast. So go back to that 3.4% for 18. That's what they're going to have in this budget. And they both bodies, Senate and House, have decided they're not going to reforecast. What I think is going to happen, you see from this chart, we're growing at 6.2% right now. That's a little bit higher than where we're probably going to land, but I would not be surprised if we're 5% or above 
come the end of this year. And just so you know, each 1% above the forecast is equivalent to $200 million. We've got a $20 billion general fund budget, 20, 20 billion. So each 1% is 200 million. And that 200 million, if you don't change the forecast for the years after, translates to a 200 million each year just from the one year change. So if we get, a, we, if we get 1%, we don't lower our forecast for 19 and 20, that's 600 million more dollars to the state budget. So I'm actually pretty positive about that. You know, of course we know that this, these, the, the two competing houses are, are locked up into Medicaid expansion, and that's almost $400 million difference in their budgets. Almost $400 million. They're locked up about that. I have no idea what's going to happen. I do know it's two against one, two, the House and the Governor against the Senate. And I will say, people, you know, my history, usually two against one wins, but you don't know, okay? So. Um, I'm, 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 I'm optimistic about this side of it, the revenues, okay? So I think it's going to come in 5% or more. And that means 300 million, because we're at 3, 4, 5 would be 300 million, 300 million, 300 million, 900 million more eventually, if nothing changes, goes into this, this budget. Now, where is that prioritized? It could be prioritized in a lot of different ways because we've had a very, very tight budget to the state and there's a lot of needs across the various categories. Um, this is, is an important chart, I think. So you can really, you know, numbers are, are one thing, but they show the policy. Okay, that's what I want you to sort of put in your mind, is the policy surrounding. So look at the top. I organized this by compound growth rates. Okay, growth and then compound. Look what's at the top. Medicaid. This goes back to 2001 appropriations through 2018, okay? And so compound growth in Medicaid is 7.4%. So you want to know why K-12 is only at 2.5? Well, it's, it's three reasons. One, slower growth in revenues since the recession, you know, which leaves us only here, compound, 3% over that long period of time. Now, it did better up to 2009, and then it's, it sort of fell off a cliff, and so but 3%, so the last seven, nine years, you know, haven't been very good for providing funds from the state to K-12. Um, and it's showing up here. Actually, you did worse than that, K-12 funding throughout the state, funding. Well, the reason is this didn't slow down. Medicaid did not slow down growth. It continued at that 6 to 8 9% rate of growth, eating up available general funds that were available, okay? And this is a high priority to policymakers, but it's such a large share of the general fund, there's no way it could, could be avoided that they would have to slow the growth in spending for that. The other thing they did was they cut higher ed. You see the compound growth in operating funds from the state to higher education. And I'm sure William Mayer would tell you this. So what they did in exchange was they provided uh, money to help build buildings in exchange for operating support. And that started showing up in the amount of general fund debt service that needed to be paid. So that's the second fastest grower because it sort of was the ability of the state to push off, you know, the need to pay for that debt. Well, well, we'll give you debt now and we'll worry about the payment later. Well, that's caught up and I'll show you a chart in a second on that. So you can see sort of how this fits in. Slower growth in revenues, continuing growth in Medicaid, because of health care cost increases and utilization, more people, the com combination of the above, and then the decisions to provide, you know, instead of operating debt and then finally catching up. And, and so what's happened? So this is the local governments in general were, were, were the slowdown in state funding for all sorts of local programs. This is a chart I keep track of because I want to see what the state's policy is to local government. So these are all the areas the state gives money back to localities, K-12 being the biggest, okay? You see, five, you know, right here in the, in the introduced bill, we don't, have a, we don't have an adopt the budget yet, the introduced bill in 19, $6.2 billion in general funds out of $20 billion budget or $9 billion back to localities. That's two-thirds of state aid to localities is K-12, okay? The other big ones would be the comp board, the CSAs, um, aid the police, local jail per diems, you know, even, even in here is the 
um, the car tax reimbursement, 950. So those are the big items. But two thirds is K-12. It's the most important. And look at the look at the percent of the general fund. Right before the recession, 35 percent of the state's general fund went to K-12. It's now been hovering in this 29 percent range. Okay. So again, they've had to continue paying Medicaid and more and more debt service. And so the slowdown in general funds has shown up as what the percentage of the state's pie for the general fund has gone to K-12 and to localities in general. 52%, now it's in that 43% range. And so it really hasn't changed with the introduced budget or the adopted budget. So the, the overall policy, you, you, you hear about numbers and millions and hundreds of millions. Well, really the percentages have not changed. And then think of it in terms also when you start thinking what the state gives you, inflation. You know, is it really more than inflation? And it really, this introduced budget is not more than inflation. Whoops. Okay, now, just to give you a little more detail. Um, so here's this Medicaid growth. And this is why it's important because it affects K-12 funding so much. And there's some really big things going on in Medicaid right now, okay? So the growth rates, these are over 10 years and then since the recession, you didn't see much of a slowdown, you know, even the last few years, 16 and 70, back in that big range right here. They forecasted low for 18. This was lower even the previous year, but it came in at 6.5, actually, not 4.1. So they had to put more money into it in the, in the actual budget for 18 than they thought a year ago. And then look at this. You're going, wow, that's an anomaly. How are they getting a growth forecast of 2.3 and 3.4 percent? Well. I mean, and that has huge implications for the budget, 19 to 20, because we're talking, it's almost as big as K-12, Medicaid spending now, general fund. And so, wow, that's built into that budget, that governor's introduced budget, and the adopted budgets by the House and Senate, this low forecast. Well, how's that happening? They're moving from about 30% of the state spending on Medicaid uh, in managed care organizations doing contracts and saying, you, you know, we're going to write you a contract, you take care of it, I and mean, that's an over, oversimplification, but to 70 percent, especially in behavioral health, but in long-term care as well, and long-term care is the biggest component of Medicaid, you know, age, blind, disabled, 60 percent. Um, so the question is, is that managed care shift, and all of a sudden they're doing it now, and all of a sudden there's going to be a huge change in growth and utilization and costs. Well, either it's going to be lousy care, I think, or we're going to come back later and have to readjust. And these contracts will all be written as if they can't do their job with what they're saying, though, they can come back and ask for more money. So we're going to see, and actually, that's actually high, those numbers. Guess why? Because those numbers don't include the 400 million savings from the ex that is assumed in the budget from, from moving to um, expansion of, of Medicaid. Because the, 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 we're, the, the, the budget for expansion saves money in three ways. It saves money by having the hospitals contribute a share because they're, they're not having to do nearly as much uncompensated care and so they're willing to take federal Medicaid to cover people that were coming into their hospitals and they're not getting any money for it through, through um, emergency care, so lots of uncompensated care. Now they're going to get paid and the state's not going to have to help them with, that, with those uncompensated care. So the state saves money. It saves money through your local uh, CSBs because there, there's now going to be federal money instead of general funds that can be used for CSBs and it saves money through prisons and jails because people that are in prisons and jails can now qualify for Medicaid. So when they go to the hospital for something wrong, a pregnant woman in a jail would be paid by the state general funds, now it can be paid by Medicaid. So it saves it in those three ways and the estimates are almost $400 million over the biennium, over the two years. But that's not in those. So I'm gonna show you something in a second. Um, well, this chart is trying to say the long-term case for the sl like slowdown in Medicaid it's hard to see because the largest growth is an over 85 population of Virginia expected. So you see right now we're, you know, less than 150, double by, you know, 20 years. And age blind disabled, again, 60% of Medicaid, 25,000 plus people are in long-term care facilities paid by Medicaid 100%. And I did, I've done studies on this, most of them are over 85. 
So it's hard to see the slowdown in utilization for Medicaid over the medium to long term. Again, it's going to be a strain on the state's budget unless something changes with how we deal with Medicaid. Um, here's the debt service that I was talking about. You know, the, the, the half of this or more general fund side is, is colleges, is college buildings. So you can see the growth. We used to be a pay-as-you-go state. We started running out of money, started providing debt, especially in the C in 09, how it really went up. And so we're now, again, don't get too alarmed because it's 20 billion and we're now up to that over 800 million. So it's still, you know, less than 10 percent, you know, less about 5 percent, I should say, of the state's general fund. But it's growing. It's a, it's a cost increaser, you know, that the state has to pay for. This is, has implications right here, this chart. And you're going to see a slowdown in debt issuance by this. You already saw it this session. The state is very worried about what the bond rating agencies think about Virginia's uh, debt capacity. We're a AAA rated state. We want to stay there. That's one of the highest priorities of the General Assembly and the governors to stay a AAA rated state. But we're sort of maxed out. Now, not technically, because we have a self imposed 5% cap on our uh, general fund plus transportation revenues on the ability to issue debt. And so, yeah, there's some capacity, but not a lot. And we're right at that edge already. And so there's a lot of pushback. We've got to quit issuing as much debt. And so that has implications for lots of things. You know, transit, John, for one. You know, they're running out of, they use tran uh, debt, debt, and that's why they want to issue more debt for public transit to use as a state share of, of capitals because there's not much capacity left. This is us, the blue line, AAA rated state, our, our debt per capita. This red line is the median state, double A, single A. Well, guess what? This green light is the other AAA rated state. There's like eight or nine of them. Look at the difference. And, there's, and so you can see why Wall Street's looking at us and going, wow, you guys, we, you better be liquid. You better have a good economy or we're going to downgrade you. Because we, you know, we've pretty much maxed out our credit card. I did a little chart here to try to look at a, the longer, to medium to longer picture if we continue on the trends we're on. And you can see why they really want to bend that cost curve on Medicaid. Because remember, go back to that chart where I showed you sort of over the last 30 years, we've grown 6 to 8, 9 percent Medicaid. So I said at the low end, let's just say we continue growing at 6 percent, which they're not forecasting right now. They're not forecasting that. If we grow at 6 percent, this is what happens to our percent of the general fund based on official revenue estimates, 3 to 4 percent. This is what happens, we assume direct aid up to K-12 stays at, at 3 percent, you know, roughly. You know, it, it, can, it drops slightly versus the amount of revenue available because we're a little higher in the general fund. But everything else is almost unsustainable because everything else has been cut over the years since 2009 that this isn't sustainable, you know, uh, higher ed, public safety, you know, uh, judicial system, you know, economic development, everything else the state does is embodied in that, in that, uh, in this line up here, and they've already been cut to the bone. State employee salaries, for example, you know, or you basically can assume it's in that line, you know, and so state employees haven't got very many salary increases since 2009. Um, so that's why they want to bend that Medicaid cost curve as well as bend the revenue line, you know, grow better, have a better economy. Those two things are, are sort of the linchpins of what's going to be available for K-12 from the state. Those two, so that's, that's sort of the main things you keep in mind. Better growth, sort of, we've got to slow the growth in, in Medicaid spending. This is the state's general fund budget. So if you have a copy of my presentation, you look at this later, but I break it down basically by secretarial area, but also by, in some cases, things we really want to know, like the, like the debt service. But look at Medicaid. So this is the implication of that low forecast plus Medicaid expansion shows up in the introduced budget. And you'll see there is zero growth from 18 to 19 in Medicaid spending. That has never happened in my 35 years here doing this. They are, they are putting in this budget zero growth because of the low growth forecast and then on top of that the Medicaid expansion savings. That shows up as zero growth in Medicaid spending in the general fund budget. Good luck with that. Okay. So, and then the next year, not much, 3%. So in total, they're only going to put in 
$145 million in new money because of the combination of those two in Medicaid, and it's been a lot more than that in the last whenever. Um, now you can see all the talk about how much we're putting into K-12, 400, we're doing re-benchmarking, and we're doing all this, well, in the introduced budget, and it has, it's not going to change much if they adopt either the House or Senate, relatively speaking, a little bit on the margins, but not a lot. We'll talk about that in a second. So look at K-12. So when they talk about, you know, a $500 million in additional money, that sounds like a lot, but remember, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, in general funds, plus, plus the lottery, too, we're talking about, when you throw the lottery in, 2020, that's $7 billion. It's almost $7 billion in, in state funding for K-12. So, so $250 million out of $7 billion is not a lot. In fact, it's, it's look at the growth here, 100, uh, $103 million in the second year. So, yeah, they put a little more in the first year. In the second year, way less than the rate of inflation. Hundred million, so they really have just sort of put a marker in the second year. So we got to hope that we get better revenues in 18. That 300 million I was talking about, so they actually can adequately fund K-12 in the second year. Okay. Now here's here is the rebenchmarking. There's a couple interesting items on, on this to me, um, and and that is the biggest driver of rebenchmarking is is guess what? It's salaries. It's it's the pay, and they go back. And they, they do their prevailing cost calculations, um, and it's, it's lagged a few years back because that's when they have data. And they look at what the change is over the two-year period for a bunch of different items, but the biggest one being salaries, teacher salaries. And they also include a state, the state raises, and they annualize those if, they've, if they'd, they had included those in their budget. This is very, very low right here. This is the prevailing salary cost plus the 2% state salary. The prevailing almost didn't change at all because the state salary makes up most of that, that the 2% of that prevailing cost increase. And so it sounds like a lot, 210, you know, the, the rebench market, but it's very low compared to historically. If you go back, not this decade, but because it's been low pretty much all the time because there hasn't been any salary increases hardly across the state. So the prevailing cost increase for rebench market have been very, very low. Uh, go back in the 2000s, prior to the recession, and this number was up to $1.5 billion for rebenchmarking over the two-year period, not half a billion. And because, again, the teacher pay increases were more on the order of 5 and 6% over two years, more, even more. The other big thing, the other interesting thing is um, substitute teachers of this non-personal support cost. Substitute teachers are the biggest single item. School divisions are having to, having to pay for substitute teachers a lot more than they used to. And you can tell me the implications of how that, and you know, maybe you don't do that as much here in this school division, but statewide, substitute teachers have, have, have had to pay for a lot more and use a lot more substitute teachers. Healthcare premiums, again, showing up outside of Medicaid, the state pays for, helps pay for school division health care for their, for their employees, and that was up 10%. That wasn't up 2%. Per year, it was up 10, 5 percent each year. So it's, again, healthcare costs are showing up even here in the rebenchmarking, and so it's again a cost driver is healthcare. What did the introduced budget do? Um, what were the main things? We just talked about rebenchmarking. That's the top line. It provided uh, there was a little better sales tax money <coughs> showed up in the forecast, so they they gave you that. Um, they had to use general funds for the literary fund. Remember, the literary fund had been rated for years and years and years to help pay for teacher retirement. It could be used for two things, literary funds. It's basically unclaimed property, fines and fees the state collects, and it builds up a literary fund. It's used to subsidize loans back to local school divisions. Uh, it hasn't been used for much for that for a couple reasons. Uh, one of the big ones is we've had such low interest rates, the subsidy isn't that great anymore because it's already low. Um, but the other constitutionally allowed use of literary fund is for teacher retirement, you can, which is normally funded with its general funds, the state portion through the standards of quality. Well, they can substitute general funds with literary funds, so they've rated the literary fund, and it had gotten so low that it has to be minimally required to be, I think, $80 million in the pot has to be there, and they didn't have that, so they had to use general, put general funds back in the literary fund. They had to go the opposite way, and so it wasn't available. It actually had to re restore funding to the literary fund. 
and use general funds for that. And then you could see the governor uh, proposed a $51 million salary increase basically in the, the last portion of the biennium. December 2019, there's only seven months to go in the new biennium. And so that's why the cost is only $51 million because you're only paying the state share of seven months of a salary increase. And it's the state share, not, you know, state share is, is uh, about probably 40% or less of the true cost. You've got to cover, you've got to cover your share, plus you've got to cover the 100% of all the people they don't cover. So you actually pay a lot more than the state than they, if you do the whole 2%. But, you know, the, so that's again how they, it sounds good, 2% salary gets, but it's backloaded, and so the, the amount of money isn't uh, that much. Um, now, the two proposals um, that the House and Senate had reflect their differences in one of the areas where they reflect differences in this Medicaid expansion fight they have. You know, the House has a lot more money because they're doing Medicaid expansion, they're saving that 400 million, you know, and the Senate doesn't, so they're losing the 400 million that's in there, and so you see that show up and what they do with, with salary increases for teachers. And so this slide shows you that. So here's the House. They actually added 36 million to move that start date from December back to July. Okay, they, they did the whole year, they did almost, they did the whole year, the whole last year, 20, fiscal 20. So it cost them 36 million more dollars for the state share to do that. The Senate didn't do any salary increase, so they saved that 51 million in their budget. So they don't have one. And they said in their budget, well, if we get the money, better revenues, we'll revisit this, provide salary increase, but they didn't include it in their, their actual dollars. The other thing the House did, the big thing, because they had more money, was they put uh, some more general funds into this flexible lottery distribution, which um, their policy has been to get the lottery money to 40% of it to be sent back to school divisions for your flexible, for what, use for whatever you want. Not, don't tie it to a program, don't tie it to a particular use. And so their budget gets them to that 40% goal that they've had and um, they've had, they had to add general funds to replace lotteries being used for other things so they could bring the lottery money back in. Think of lottery money as general funds. They're totally fungible back and forth. So often what happens with lottery funds is when it, when it grows, when, you know, when let's say you, you get 30 more million than you want, the state will just remove 20 million, 30 million general funds from K-12 because so, they're completely fungible. And so, yes, technically, legally, they're using all lottery for, for K-12, like they're supposed to do, but there's nothing that says they have to use general funds for K-12. So if they get more lottery, they can just remove general funds, and they've done that for ever since I've been here, okay? I was here when the lottery started, you know, back in the 90s. I worked for Senate Finance, so it's um, been done continually, fungible. So those are the big proposals. There's some, interestingly, there's some ones that are important to me at least. Now, the 7.7 7 million was that, they, that the House uh, removes, for both of them remove actually, was the only item that the governor's introduced bill had included from the Board of Education's recommendations to improve the standards of quality from two years ago. Very, very, the, one of the smallest items for their recommendations, but that was the only thing that was in the government to actually implement the board's State Board of Education recommendations to increase the standards of quality, and that was removed in both budgets. Um, so that's interesting. The at-risk add-on is is something is also um, um, uh, I, I like to watch for because it's one of the key areas that the policy areas the state does to try to provide funding to close the achievement gap. It's basically a flexible way to to get more money to, to challenge schools because it's based on free lunch, how much your percentage of free lunch is. And so um, the House took that, but the Senate, even with a lot less money, kept it, kept that introduced increase in the at-risk add-on. And so it signaled that that's important to them in the Senate, even though they didn't have as much money, they did keep that. And, and they did that for a couple things, actually, um, smaller items. They kept some monies in there for trying to at least continue a little bit of progress towards funding the, the challenge schools that we have and to try to 
find ways to close the achievement gap. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a second as well. So not huge differences in K-12s. That's why I said the introduced budget is generally, you know, whatever happens, make, there's, there's going to be marginal changes on the edges. Yeah, and it's important, this, the, the, the teacher raise. But we're talking, again, $7 billion in state funding. And this is, we're, we're talking, you know, less than $100 million in differences. So it's not, not huge. Um, I did want to show you, and you're probably aware of this, but I, I just had it for the record, you know, so you have it and you want to look back at this presentation. This is where you get your state money from, and this is the current year appropriations. And so this is the standards of quality. This is what's absolutely required for you to do, and this is what, by both, both localities, this is your required local match. Now, granted, this, this is what the state requires. I guarantee you do a lot more than that. But that's what's required. And this, but this is what they give you for the standards of quality. You see the basic aid's the biggest. They give you that, that distribution of sales tax based on school age population. There's no composite. That's the one major thing the composite index isn't applied to, just for your edification. That sales tax distribution based on school age population, the composite is not a factor in that. It just comes back to you based on how many kids you have, not even public school kids, school age population. Everything else pretty much is going to be defined how much you get through the composite index, okay, your share of, of what, they, what they per pupil share. So James City gets 40 million, Williamsburg 2.7. Now these are the, what they call the incentive lottery category supplemental accounts, and they're not mandatory, but everyone does them because, again, money's fungible and you want money. So you're going you're gonna to take this, but if you get it, you've got you to, uh, in most cases, not all, provide a local match. And um, you can see the, some of the big ones. This is that supplemental lottery per pupil I talked about that they wanted to get to 40%. That's how much money is coming back in 18. That should go up in 19 and 20 if the House wins in their budget, gets their budget. Um, K-3 class size reduction, at risk add on I mentioned one of the larger ones to try to um, provide funding with, with to schools with large numbers of free lunch students. Um, and, then, and then the preschool initiatives, another big one, the four-year-olds, at-risk four-year-olds, you have a program for that and you get funding. That actually composite is capped at 50%. So even you're above 50%, you get a state share of 50-50 for that. And that's the only other one that has sort of a special you know, calculation uh, according to the composite, and it's, it's 50, the max is 50% that you, you know, the state will provide, or the, or the minimum. Take a look more of that. So now a little bit broader look. So this is your per pupil amount from the state, and, I, and I, why, why I show this is because 09 was the high water mark. The blue line's the nominal, actual dollars you get. The red bars are just inflation adjusted. This is already per pupil amounts. So right now, you're getting about $4,200 per pupil from the state. But if you adjust that, uh, you know, use 2005 as your base year for inflation, you're getting a lot less because it's about a 2% average. But look at the difference. Um, so you're really, if you go back to 09, and I can't really read it here. I've got to look at it here. But it's, 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 it's probably four or $500 per pupil less on a real terms what you're getting from the state. So, the, you know, even though you got back to your, you're not, actually, you're not even in nominal terms up to where you were in 09 in, in 2018. Now, you finally get there if this is adopted by the, you know, the budget, you're going to get, you're going to get to that nominal amount in uh, 20, 2020. So you think about that. You don't even get the same. So go back to those other charts I said, you're getting a less share from the state. Well, it's, Come to roost for your school division, you know, and, and you know your costs now are more than what they were in 09 just from inflation and health care cost increases you got to pay. And so the state's providing you basically this coming by in the same as you got 09. And in real terms, it's a lot less. And that's the same with this. And then same with the state. So the state, you get less than this. You, because your composite index is so much higher, you get Think of the average composite index. It's mathematically calculated. The average locality has a 0.45 composite index, not 0 0.50, 0 0.45. That's the way they mathematically, because the state is supposed to provide statewide 
55 percent of the standards of quality and the locals provide 45. Okay, and so the mathematic composite index median is 0.45. You're 0.56 something in, in James City and almost 0.77 in Williamsburg. So that's why you get less per pupil. Okay, $1,000 less per pupil. But the same, same trend occurs statewide. Now, the one thing I want to point out, so remember I was talking to you about how the 500 million the states providing this budget sounds like a lot, but the first year is more than the second year. Well, look at the second year. Inflation adjusted, it actually goes down. The amount of money the state's providing on an inflation adjusted basis in the second year is less. So it's not a lot of money. It's less money in real terms than what you're getting the previous year. Now, here's your composite index. A little bit of a go back to school time for some of you may be experts on this, but maybe not all of you are. So the composite index is calculated through a five-factor formula, okay? And the numerator is based on the true value of real estate, 50%, 40% your locality's Virginia just gross income of your residents, and then 10% your taxable sales, 50, 40, 10 of those three factors. And the way that was done in the 70s, the reason that was done like that, that's supposed to mirror on a statewide crude generalized basis, the capacity of a locality to raise revenue. So think of, you know, half the revenue of localities, and it's roughly true, it comes from the real estate tax. That's supposed to be reflected in the true value of real estate. Okay, and it's not your assessed value. True value, the tax department every two years does a sales assessment ratio study so that it, because not every locality uh, assesses every year, some every two years, some every four years, some every six years. So they've got to, they've got to make it apples to apples, and they look at, they do a correlation now from sales prices to assessments, and then they, they levelize it statewide. Okay, and that's what true value real estate is. So everyone's apples to apples. Um, Virginia adjusted gross income and sales tax are pretty self-explanatory, but Virginia adjusted gross sales is supposed to represent all your other taxes other than sales tax and real estate. So your B poll, your M and T, if you have it, your you know fines and fees, you know whatever you do is supposed to be represented by that wealth of your residents. That's very crude, obviously, and it doesn't work for some localities. And I'll give you an example: Richmond, so near where I live, they have a higher composite index in the surrounding counties because one of the reasons there's a couple, but one of them is because they have some really wealthy people who live on Cary Street, etc., West End. And so if, I call it the Warren Buffett effect. If Warren Buffett lived in your locality, and this has happened to some, like Washington County recently, they had, they had some, some, a company move in with a bunch of well-paid people, and their composite index went up, even though you, you can't tax income in the locality. And Warren Buffett lives in a three-bedroom, two-branch house. So if you lived here, you'd get hammered. You have a billion dollars showing up in your Virginia, but not getting any real estate revenue from him. And so it doesn't work for everyone. It works for most, but not everyone. It's crude. The denominator, just as important, in fact, the most important element of the composite index is your ADM. That's the biggest factor. And Richmond, again, relative to their population, has a very small school component. They've either left or gone to private schools, a lot of kids in Richmond. So compared to the population, they have a very small component of kids, and so their composite goes up because that numerator is not divided by that larger denominator. A place like Loudoun, rich as heck, Tons of school kids, Chesterfield, tons of school kids drives their composite index down because they have a higher percentage of kids than, the pot, than most localities do. So look at, what I wanted to show you this was, so look at your trend. So I, I, I put you back in 2010, 12, and that's actually data from 08. There's a huge lag. There's a two-year, so the, there's a, more than a two-year lag, the 1820, is based on 2015 data, okay, 2015. The one of the biggest reasons it's so lagged is because they don't have income tax data. There's amended returns, they don't get it. So that's the last piece of data that comes in too is the AGI, the, the income tax data. And that the latest data they have is 2015 for income tax data. So they can't do a composite index that's sort of concurrent, it's very lagged. So you have to think about what your situation was several years ago, you know, and how it might change. So you can think about the 2022 biennium by thinking about how your real estate values might be changing right now. And that'll give you an idea of what your composite index is going to do. So what, let's look at James City. 
Okay? So from here to here, you got wealthier relative because these are percentages of the state. That's how it's done. This is you're about one percent of the state in James City County. So real estate, one a little over one percent of the state's total value of true value real estate. But that's gone up. You've gotten wealthier relative to the state. So that that would that would normally make your composite go up because you've gotten wealthier. It's going to make you go up. But it's going to be driven down in James City because you've got a higher population relative to the state and no, more number of kids. See, ADM going up. So that's offset your growing revenue capacity. Your more kids is offset, and that's why you're relatively stable. But let's say your ADM stops growing, okay, and your wealth keeps growing. This will go up, your LCI. So think in the future that way. You know, if they're staying in tandem, Wealth going up, number of percentage of population relative to the state going up, you're going to stay relative. Or look at Williamsburg. Why? It used to be 0 0.8. I always used to say, wow, Williamsburg, 0 0.8, man, rich locality. Well, the reason is look, your sales tax is one of the big reasons. You know that. Look at the percentage of real estate, percentage of adjusted but percentage of sales tax. Even though it's a small component, it's so outsized, you know, instead of, you know, it's three times two to three times the size of those other factors. And so that it's, it makes you, your, your weighted average of your numerator compared to your denominator, and then there's the ratio. See, if this was 1.0, this ratio right here, the numerator of the denominator, you'd be 0.45. Okay, think of it that way. R numerator divided by denominator is one, they're equal, you'd be 0.45, the state's average, okay? But look at Williams, Williamsburg. You're way over 1.0 because your numerator is way bigger than your denominator. Your number of kids and population, your, your perceived wealth is way higher than the number percentage of the state's population and kids, school kids. Now, that trend has been going down because your, your uh, denominator has grown very little, but your wealth has gone down a lot since 10. And a lot of it's sales tax, see? It's dropped quite a bit. That's why you're now long, no longer 0 0.8. And it, I don't know what it's going to do in the future. You probably know better than I do. But at least that's how you can think about it, okay? About how that might change in the future, your, your, your money, folks. So that's the composite index. Any questions on that? Good. I so, sure. Actually, the, the Virginia API, is that going to change with the new federal tax form of sales tax? Going the wrong way. Is the uh, AGI? Yeah. I don't even know which way I'm going. There I am. Um, Virginia AGI, will it change with the tax plan? Re well, again, your composite in it is dependent on the state, everyone else. This, this is a zero sum game, the composite. So when people want to change it, let's say Richmond wants to, they've, they're policymakers. If I sit around, and I've done this with Richmond a number of times, they always talk about composite. We've got to change the composite. It it's not fair to us. Problem is, if you change the policy of the comp for, to help them, you will hurt everyone else. It's a zero-sum game. If you change something, it, it, it's, remember, it's, it's all around the state average. And so if someone benefits, someone else loses on, on just the composite. So people have tried to get around that by saying, we're going to do a hold harmless. We got to throw a whole bunch more money in to do that. The state's got to put a big slug of money to do a hold harmless for some, some change. There's been two policy changes in the composite index since it's, since it's happened, two. And they were both based on vast political power, okay? The first one was, this used to be 100% ADM down here, the numerator, 100%. And Ed Willie, Willie Bridge in, in Norfolk, Senator, right before I went there, he, I, I got interviewed with him, and two weeks later he died. Then I went to work for Senate Finance. He, um, Maybe I, I hope I didn't kill him, but um, no. <laughs> he, he knew that that Richmond's cohort of kids was small. So I, I got to get population. And, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of logic to that because the ability for a locality to pay for public ed is not independent of its ability to pay for its public safety, its health and welfare, its infrastructure, and everything else. And so this intuitively says it is by using ADM. This is totally, it's not. Your tax base has to be used for both. So he got one-third population. If I was creating this from start, I would put, because K-12 is about half of your budget on average, 
I would say half of the denominator is ADM, half is population, as an example, because that really reflects the ability to pay for a locality. But he got that in, and the, se and the second one was smaller. It was um, this adjustment. If you have more than 3% uh, of your AGI is from non-residents, from let's say people from North Carolina working here or along the border, you know, that's where it happens a lot, but Richmond has it. People must fly in and, and set up a business. Um, you get an adjustment of that 3% of non-residents out of your AGI. And there's about 20 localities in Virginia that get to adjust that VAGI and remove their non-resident income if you're above 3%. I, I don't think you guys, you guys aren't. I don't think you're involved in that. But guess who got that one in? You guys remember the name A.L. Philpot? Guess what his role was, Speaker of the House. <laughs> he got that in, in the 80s. So that's the kind of, you know, that's what it kind of takes to make a change to the composite index. Um, so here's what, here's where your state funding, at least I, I was able to pull up and I asked Monique on 17, because that, that didn't exist publicly yet, but, so that's why I get the one-third state, you know, here's, here's the one-third, you can hardly read that, 45 million, it's about 45, I think, 85 here, and a little bit from the federal government. Federal government's basically Title I schools and special ed. Title I, you know, there's low-income schools and special ed. That's where you get federal money for. Um, so some of the issues here that policymakers have been gra starting to grapple with is teacher supply and demand issues. And starting to recognize that less people are going to this, it's becoming, you know, it's, it's becoming a more difficult profession because the pay hasn't kept up with, particularly as the economy is improving now, and pay hasn't kept up for teachers, not as many people are going into public, I mean, into education schools, learning how to become teachers, that's definitely dropping off. And it's getting harder for a lot of places, especially those with lots of challenged schools to get teachers. And so the state is trying to, is starting to recognize that. They haven't done a whole lot yet uh, about it, but there's been conferences, and I, I was at them with legislators there, and they're nodding their heads and saying, yeah, this is a problem, but, um, you know, I think we're at the, the beginning of that, that recognition and that we've got to do something about the teaching profession to keep it viable in this state. And so, well, this quit working. I don't know. Quit working. Someone help me up here, maybe? Well, I was just pointing it before, but... Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, let's see if it, no, it doesn't work. Um, so I, I plotted, since teachers are an issue, I plotted um, two seven-year periods of the data I had. So you can see when, when revenues were flush, the, the pay from 2002 to 2009 went up like $11,000, the median pay. And then in 20, 2016, the latest data I have, it went up, less than $3,000. And in fact, I've told people that um, if it had kept pace with the rate of inflation from, from 09 to 2016, that median pay would have been s over 60,000, not 56. So it's only grown at half the rate of inflation, the median teacher pay in Virginia. And your school district is no different. Now, I heard a little discussion prior to this that um, some of that has to do with retirements of well, better paid teachers on the one end and hiring, low, you know, entry level people at the other. But still the trend, I don't, I don't, and there's probably some of that at the state level, but clearly we know because of prevailing costs, you know, the state being unable to provide much pay raises from 09 that, you know, pay raises just haven't happened since 09 either across the board. So. So along with the, you know, no longer, exp you know, increasing along the, even at the rate of inflation for teachers, and one of the reasons there's, a, there's an issue with, you know, the quality, the, uh, the ability to attract people to this profession to get quality people, it's the difficulty. This is over basically the last 10 years, and it's a statewide phenomenon. Every single locality has experienced this. You're no different 
you do have a lower level of free lunch. And the reason I just show free lunch, for example, is because that is what's tied to the state funding policies that use, that use this, this number. They don't use free and reduced. Mm -hmm. They use free lunch. Now, it's pretty much across the board as well, the state, you can add 6 to 7% to these free lunch numbers to get free and reduced. It's pretty much every locality has about the same, 6 to 7%. But you can notice the, the spike. There was a policy change in the last year that allowed um, those with those lo localities that are that are very close to 100%, they can just assume everyone needs a free lunch because it's just too hard to differentiate if you have 90% free lunch and 10% not. We're just going to give everyone a free lunch, okay? Because it's administratively difficult. But they also said, we you if you have you can count your Medicaid eligible kids as free lunch eligible, and that's the spike for Williams for the for the the joint school system here is apparently it's that. And I asked the DOE, the finance people, and that's what they said, that your Medicaid eligible folks are now in, in your free lunch program. Okay, so it added, that's why you had that spike in this, this latest year. This is the achievement gap, and, and again, you, you guys are no different. You, you basically track the state. You can see on the left-hand side your school district and the state figures, and economically disadvantaged minorities um, pretty much consistently statewide have the same lower levels of SOL achievement that, reflect, uh, that are reflecting um, um, the, the more difficult teaching environment. You know, and, and that's why I mentioned earlier the, the programs. That was, a, that was a good one to stay at, that last one. <laughs> Is it working now? Okay. All right, where are we here? Going the wrong way. All right, so this, that was, we were at that. We discussed that. I wanted to point out to you that Here's the statewide programs that are devoted to specifically to trying to close the achievement gap through various programs, either flexible or directed towards certain things. And um, we've talked about reducing the class size, that at-risk add-on. The, the SOQ has one program, one mandatory program, the Prevention Remedi Intervention Remediation Program. Um, but you can see them, I, I, I rank them in terms of size of dollars. But look at the bottom, 7.7% of total state funding is devoted to this. Maryland just did a study, and Virginians don't like to use Maryland studies, but you know, it's the latest one available. It's a really good one because it was done by a firm that I'm aware of, Augenblick. And they calculated in Maryland, and it's pretty much true nationwide, you need about 30% more to really attack the problem. Because you've got to do a lot of wraparound services. There's a lot of things you need to do, you know, better reading programs, more teachers, even you know, aides and teachers, two teacher, two adults. For the portion that really need help, disruptive students, et cetera, you know, and you continue teaching the other ones, you really need two adults in a, in a classroom often to really attack this problem, or at least after school programs, you know. So 30% is a good number in your mind. The state has 7.7 .7 devoted to this issue directly. And, and you know, I, I like to focus on that because I like to work on that. To me, that's the area I really like to work on is trying to get the state to recognize, to close this achievement gap, we need to do more. That's sort of a passion of mine. Um, now, the standards of quality itself, you know that they don't really recognize what you have to spend. And I put down here uh, both your localities. You spend 100% more in James City than you're required to. In that required local match, you, you put 100% more, twice as much than you're required. Williamsburg, a little less, 35% uh, more. Um, you can see the numbers down here. The the Weighted average across the state is 100%. Localities put in double what they're required to. And, and mainly, the biggest, there's, a there's a number of reasons, but the biggest single one is that the standards of quality only recognize two-thirds of the positions that are employed. They, don't rec they recognize a couple thousand, you know, uh, like 900 out of the 3,000 assistant principals, like only 3,000 of the 19,000 teacher aides are even recognized in their standards of quality. And so VML and VACO and others, Virginia First Cities, we put in budget amendments to get the state to do that, to recognize, to, to, make, to say, look, you know, school divisions are employing these statewide. 
you need to recognize these are standards of quality. Well, it's a money issue. As we went back to the very beginning, they don't have the money to do that. So it's not necessarily they don't want to, they just don't have the money. And so in 2009, you know, go back to that, when they the, the dropped off a cliff, the amount of state funding, I mean, the amount of revenues were available for K-12 and they had to do all this cutting. They just did a bunch of arbitrary cuts because they didn't have the money. They said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna impose the biggest one. We're gonna impose a support position cap. We're just not gonna pay you any more for support positions other than this artificial cap. And they saved 350 million a year doing that. And you still, you still employ those people. <coughs> you just don't get coverage by them anymore. Um, another big reason is um, the linear weighted average methodology that's used in the rebenchmarking um, treats every locality the same. So I always like to say Lee County is given the same one dot as Fairfax County, literally. So their average costs count just the same as Fairfax, even though they have 500 times more teachers, you know, and they're paid a lot more because they have to be because the cost of living up there. So the state, because there's way many more rural school divisions, that those dot plots brings that prevailing cost down. If they use the weighted average, it would be it's only, it's only about 88% of the weighted average, the prevailing cost. So that's a 12% boost right there if they use the weighted average and paid you that. Um, here's the board's recommendations. You can see the biggest one, they did this a couple years ago, was, was getting rid of that support position cap. $340 million a year. This in total is $600 million. Remember I said the only thing I was in the introduced bill was the, that assistant principal one. Uh, right here, and it was really only for small schools too. That have to use, that have, that don't get a full time. Uh, I'm sorry, not assistant, full time principal is what they put in, and the governor for 20 only too. Some small schools have to share a principal, and so he put in a budget in his introduced budget to fund every school gets a, a principal. Um, but all the big ones weren't in there, you know, school counselors, uh, assistant principals. Remember I said only. A third or less of the assistant principals are funding their standards of quality. Well, to fund all, all of them, 74, to actually do an adequate calculation of what should be, you know, it costs $71 million. They don't have that. So none of these board recommendations. And it was hard to get the board to do this. They didn't want to do that because they knew the political problem. If we got out and put this, was the General Assembly really going to do it? Do we want to get into that fray? Well, they did because it got so overwhelming, obvious that the standards of quality were inadequate, that they came out and said that. Just now getting the money for it's difficult. Um, this chart was up, JLARC does this every year in January. They, they compare us to the rest of the states on a, on a number of different measures, and I pull out a couple. Um, we're a wealthy state, not as wealthy as we were. You know, our economy hasn't been growing as fast <coughs> since the recession, mainly because the defense slowed down and we're so dependent on that of the federal government. Um, so now we're 12th in per capita personal income. We're kind of average, you know, we're, we're less than average on state taxes on a per capita basis. We have to do more at the local level to make up for it. Um, but our, our state per pupil funding reflects the fact that we have low state taxes. Uh, we get better when you put the local money in because, again, the locals have to do more. But look at our, our salaries, average salary compared to our wealth. You would think that this would be fairly close to this because we have to compete in our economies to attract good teachers when the cost of living is such and we're wealthier and so we have better pay. So, you know, you would think that would be a lot closer. Well, it's not. And so, again, that's, that's an indicator. There's a gap between what we pay our teachers and how we're going to compete in getting quality people out of that profession versus what, what's out there in the rest of our economy. Now, look, take a brief look at your uh, local revenues. And what, what I, I, I laid it all out here. I wanted to learn myself coming here. I wanted to see what it looked like. And so uh, that was one reason I did it. But what came out of this was very similar to what was happening statewide. So your local revenue growth right here, Williamsburg, 9.8 right here in, in James City. You've done better here. But look at the population inflation. Way more than your revenue growth. Way more. You would think that over time that would be roughly in sync. Your revenues and population inflation would grow at the same to provide the services you need. You would think it would roughly be in sync. Well, same things happen at the local level as the state. There's been a divergence. And not as bad, but 29% versus 22 still 
James City County, your revenues haven't been keeping pace um, and in, in total revenues. So, uh, and, and you can look at total revenues too, 12% versus over 20, total revenues 17 versus 29. Again, that's why you're feeling stress in providing what you want to do for, for the services. You just haven't been keeping pace. Or, or this is from 09 to 17, the latest data I had. So that's, that's the biggest takeaway from that. And you can look at the individual items. I'm, cert I'm certain you'll know, for example, in, uh, uh, where was it? There was something I was going to show you. Transient occupancy for Williamsburg. I know it's been an issue here. They actually had a 10% decline from 09 to 17. So there's, you can look at the individual items, draw your own conclusions get a copy of this presentation. This rising, this is a statewide phenomenon. I just inserted your localities in here. All cities from 09 to 16, calendar 16, had to raise their tax rates to get the, they had the same slow growth in reven, local revenues and slow growth in real estate revenue. Even to keep the slow growth, they've had to raise their tax rates. Counties too. Now you've actually raised it less than the statewide, been able to keep it less, but you still had to raise it from 09, your rates. Now a little look at your jobs. This was kind of interesting to me because the reason I wanted to look at this was, okay, let's think about the future here. Let's think about how, you know, the two biggest pillar is we, we need more money. We need more tax revenue. We need a healthy economy. We want people to get jobs and their incomes grow, and that's the, mo that's the thing we're really trying to do. And so what's the prospects for that? Um, I went back five years to see what's changed. And the thing with that's, that was interesting to me, and I combined both Williamsburg and James City sort of as a regional economy. I combined them both. So I didn't separate the two. I have that, and I may even put it in the appendix here if you want to look at it, but I combined it here. And what you find is that the biggest growth is the higher paying jobs. So you've been losing low paid jobs in this region. They haven't been growing nearly as fast. Total job growth 4.5, low wage, and I define that as under $800 a week, actually declined 2% over that five year period. But your higher paid jobs, were, although numbers were less, they were faster growing. So that's good news. You guys are getting higher paid jobs here somehow, some way. And um, total wages even more dramatic. The low paid jobs, 1% a year growth in total wages because you've lost people and they, they haven't been paid much more. And so total wages for the low paid people haven't hardly gone up at all. It went from 123 to 130 million um, for the quarter. I, I kept the same quarter, second quarter, to keep it apples to apples, and 28% growth in wages. So again, it's showing up. You know, you're getting more wages from higher paid jobs. So that's good news. So the summary kind of obvious, um, I think. <laughs> you know, you got a big bite out of a K-12 from the state. Recession had a big problem. Medicaid, you know, is it going to continue to grow? Or will managed care actually work and slow the growth in Medicaid? Um, and, and will your local economy continue to grow faster so you, your tax revenues will follow and increase? Um, there is a point here on this tax, this federal tax law that I think I've been telling people. Um, and tax reform is going to be a big issue at the state level this year. And it's because of this biggest, this is the biggest portion of the reason. This state and local salt or state and local tax cap at $10,000. Um, what that is going to do, we have about 40% are obviously higher income taxpayers that use itemized deductions. They have an item on, the, on our state tax return, okay? 60% use the standard deduction. The standard deduction is, I think, what, $6,000 right now, standard, state standard deduction. Um, so they cap the, the, the federal one, at total property tax and income tax that's paid on your tax return can now be no more than $10,000 can you claim. And it was unlimited before. So if you paid $50,000 in income taxes and $10,000 in, in property taxes, a high income person, You'd write off 60,000. Well, now they're capped at 10. So what that's going to do at the state level, because you have to, if you file for itemized returns at the federal level, you've got to file itemized at the state level. You cannot pick and choose. If you file standard at the Fed, 
you have to file standard at the state. So the reason there's going to be tax reform is because there's going to be a whole lot more taxes paid for state income taxes now than there was prior to this tax because it's going to go from 60 to 90 percent of people taking standard reduction. Only 10 percent, they're theorizing, is going to be able to utilize the federal or going to want to take the federal itemized deduction because it's gone up to 24,000. There's standard deduction and capped at 10, the state and local. So there's going to be a lot of people that fall in between that. And so they're now going to be say, I'm not going to itemize deduction. I'm going to take the federal standard deduction, 24,000. Well, guess what? They've now got to take the 6,000 state standard deduction, whereas before they were taking unlimited, you know, uh, unlimited amount. Although you had to remove your income tax, you could still, you could still um, take, you know, take higher amounts of, of other, of the other portion of it. Can't do that now, and so they're going to pay more state income taxes, and the politicians aren't going to like that, at the state at the state level. They're not going to want this automatic tax increase. And so they're going to do something to make it revenue neutral in the fall. Um, the problem for local governments, though, is you're going to have a harder time, I think, saying we're going to raise that property tax rate because upper income you can't itemize anymore. So it's one more factor. It may not be the biggest, but it's one more factor local governments have to think about if they rely more on real estate taxes is that federal government is no longer going to subsidize that for people. It's, it's a subsidized tax, both the state income tax, and that's why you hear New Jersey and California, you know, and Connecticut, you know, uh, got so upset at that cap because they had higher local, uh, higher state taxes, and the, their, their upper income people cannot itemize, they won't itemize anymore, will be able to. And so it's basically a tax increase on them. And it, but it's going to happen in Virginia, too. We're going to go from 40% itemizers to 10% itemizers. And that'll have, a, that'll have a thought process, you know, on that no longer being nearly as subsidized by federal tax deductions. And I think, oh, so the bottom line is we need to get the state, and we've been trying this, you know, VML VACO, I've been talking about this for a long time, is state needs, since 09, and they need to step to the plate more. They need to help restore what they used to do with state aid to K-12, get it back up to where it was, at least on real terms. Remember what I said, at the total statewide level, they're about $500 per pupil in real terms less than what they, they did in 09. And to just to get back to that would require about 700, not even more than what the SOQ recommendations of the board were. My calculations, it would be about $750 million a year the state would have to put in in real terms to get back to that, $750 million per year, above the status quo. Think of that rebenchmarking they just did and what's in there as status quo. That's just basically keeping you even, not, not narrowing that $500 per pupil gap at all. they got to go $750 million above that per year to, to get you back to where you were in 2009 in terms of state aid real estate aid. So how do you do that at state level? Well, one of the problems is the sales tax just keeps getting eroded through more and more internet sales, um, more and more services being bought by people, not goods, particularly millennials and people my age. We don't need as much stuff. We just want to go on trips. So don't pay the sales tax on that. We don't, we don't pay on a lot of your internet sales because uh, they're not required to collect it. Um, so we need to modernize our sales tax base, I think, and start applying it to some services. Personal services would be a good start. Things like auto repair labor, in my opinion, you know, which you only pay it on the parts, not the labor. People will disagree with me like crazy, and they can. But I mean, I, the, the, we're moving that way in the world, and, and our base is eroding, the sales tax base. Um, that's just a personal opinion, by the way. Communication sales tax base is only 80% of what it was when they adopted it for local governments because that hasn't been modernized. And think about Hulu, Amazon Prime, Netflix, none of that's taxed. Kids are all moving to that. Um, also, the prepaid wireless cards, more and more people, they don't get these, these plans, you know, the Verizon wireless monthly plan. They just go and refill their card in 7-Eleven uh, for $100. That doesn't get taxed. I mean, it doesn't apply to that every time they refill it. There was a bill put in the General Assembly, didn't get any votes. Delegate Watts from Northern Virginia put it in for VML Vaco. Didn't want to hear any of that. So 
but you get 20% less from which is what, that's, remember, it's a distribution back to localities. It was a, it was a change that put all the various tax communication into one 5% tax, and it stayed the same since then, even though the sales tax rate's gone up statewide to 5.3. Here it's 6%, Hampton Rosary. The communication is still 5%, what it was back then, plus the world has moved. The, 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 that, that area of the economy has moved to what I just described. And that's why it's 20% less, what you get. So again, you're getting eroded at the local level. And, and um, you've got to keep up with the time so your base gets eroded as well. So glad to answer any questions. It was a lot, I think, to absorb. Hope it was clear. Thank you. Yes, sir. On the free and reduced lunch calculation, how is it any more cumbersome to determine whether your free and reduced lunch percentage is 98 versus 54? I mean, what's the logic in... You get to a certain level and you don't have to, you get to just count 100. Right. The, the re, it's, not, it's not the difficulty in counting. It's <laughs> just that they don't want to separate the kids out. They're applying, they're providing lunches, and they're, they're not going to bring the third graders in and say, you 10 are going to sit over here and not get a free lunch, and you 90 are all going to get a free lunch. They're just saying, forget it. They're just going to provide lunches through the, you know, they're, they're, they're providing, and it's just easier just to, when you get to these levels just to just to say, hey, here, come get your lunch, everyone. That's what it is. Can I ask you sure. a question about, uh, about the uh, uh, property taxes uh, and, and real estate assessments in particular? We talked about it in terms of the, the real estate, the uh, composite index being a component of it, mm -hmm. which showed that you know, we were fairly stable over, over the periods that you looked at. And we also talked about it in terms of um, providing some information about the um, statewide averages in terms of uh, property tax rate increases and so forth. How much of that is, a, is the, a reflection simply of the fact that the Northern Virginia real estate market collapsed during that time period? Uh, we raised our um, real estate tax uh, by seven cents here in James City County. Uh, that was primarily to bring us back up to the level of real, of real estate tax collections that we were at previously. My understanding is that in places like Prince William and Loudoun, they had to raise that rate by 15 or 20 cents just to get back up to where they had right, been. Right. Is that right? So it's, it's not really a matter of whether we're doing more or less, but rather um, just having to adjust those rates to reflect the current well, property well, you, you're, realities. John, what you're talking about is true. You had to do less, and I yeah. showed that in a chart. but. But the, but the tax rate has nothing to do with the composite index. Okay, no. so no, but it, does, it does reflect your reality, yes. Right, your so, revenue so reality. What, what it did in that case was um, we looked relatively wealthier because the overall statewide real estate assessment values in Northern Virginia had declined so much. <coughs> yes, yeah. in fact, in 2011, that, that biennium, there was a hold harmless put in place because 95 localities out of the 130 had higher composite indexes based on the collapse in real estate values in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so politically, for the basically the first time, I've been around 35 years, there was, they did a hold harmless for basically a year and said, we're gonna put $100 million in and not change your composite index for this one year to let you tide you over because of this collapse in real estate values in Northern Virginia. Remember, it's a zero sum game. Everyone else didn't go as bad as them so your composite naturally went up because theirs went down. Because the whole state, the whole state true value real estate decline based on Northern Virginia's collapse made you look better. And so your composite ends went up and they did this hold harmless, but that only lasted one year and a little bit of the second year. But um, you're right, and, and that's, that's part of it. But I think, I think the trend is still, let's see, real estate right here. Yeah, this was, this was right at that point. You're, 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 you're inching up. You're still inching up. And, but you're right. It is lag. Remember, that's 2015 data. And so is Northern Virginia recovering faster now or not? I, I, I don't think so, actually. I think, I think they've sort of stabilized. And so the question becomes, are you guys just getting richer now? I, I don't know the answer to that, really. Yeah. Our, our, we just got our assessments. I think for, for existing properties, we were less than 1% increase over the okay. last two years. OK. Well. Probably gives you a good idea then where you are in the future. Has there been any calculation to show what local governments have done to make up how much for the shortfalls in the state? Yeah. Does it give some idea of 
Yeah, that we've done, VML and VACO have done some. In fact, uh, um, there, was, there was a presentation done at the finance, uh, finance forum in January as well about that. Um, it's been across the board things. There's been cuts in staff, salary freezes, uh, you know, delays in capital and equipment. Um, I showed you the chart on the median real estate tax rate increases. You know, you've heard about Henrico doing a meals tax increase and Richmond just instituting another one on top of the existing. So it's a plethora of things. Uh, on, the, on the expenditure side, clearly localities have had to tighten down on, on, on uh, their staff, on the staff and on the salaries of people and probably benefits. I mean, I don't know your particular local situation there, but statewide, no doubt. There's but they, they haven't done a dollar figure. How, a dollar, because it's, it's different and every locality has been kind well, of different. I know different, that, yeah. but I mean, it would seem that it could be added up to show, because it, what this, the state board said about 600 million. Yeah. What you the, know, is there some? Talking about school board, school cuts? School reductions, yeah, you mean? Yeah, for school, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can do that kind of calculation indirectly by looking at the, the uh, superintendent's memo. It's a little lagged always. Um, I had to get your 17 data because mm -hmm. the 16 is only available. Um, <coughs> and you can look at what the growth is, and it's it's been it's slow. I mean that's that's it's slower. It's and it look individual localities have got different <coughs> different, but statewide they're, they've yeah K-12 spending has been slower for locals too, but faster than the state because you've had to make up for it. I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, let's go back to this chart right here. Forgot to mention this right here. So you guys on a compound basis have grown your funding by 2.5%, okay? This blue, it's grown by, <coughs> if you compound that, now it varies, but if you go from here to here and you say compound over that time, 2.5% growth in funding for, for K-12. State, 1%, 1%. So you, you've added more money than they have. You've had to make up for the slowdown in, in revenues, but like I said, and that other chart, your local revenues haven't been robust either, the growth in that. So um, you have constraints as well, like other localities have had similar, because you know we're, we're really one economy. I mean, the economy is everyone's, and it not, hasn't been doing as great. Okay. One other question about uh, recognizing there's not a lot of appetite in Richmond for modernizing the tax code. One area where there seems to have just very recently been a little bit of movement is on the internet sales front. Um, do we have any estimate of how much Virginia might actually um, receive if that? Yeah, uh, the estimate is around 300 million. 300 million. Uh, I wouldn't. I would take that with a grain of salt because really nobody knows. I mean, it's a very crude estimate. It, it could be a, more than that. Could be less, but I. I Gather, I, I would estimate it's more than that, but that's that's sort of their official line. That's how I would term it. I wouldn't even call it an estimate. I call it their official line. About 300 million per year. Jim, uh, regarding the um, 46 divisions that contribute, um, the local government contributes more than 100 percent of the required local effort. Are you aware of any studies that have compared that to ach ach student achievement or outcomes of school division performance? Is there any connection to local investment and student achievement outcomes? Have, are you aware of any work? Actually, I did one of those studies myself, uh, NCS, and back in 2002, NCSL, um, and I, I um, helped fund it for me, and I did it with some partners. And it was very difficult, actually, to, to parse that out you know, more money, uh, you know, equals better outcomes. It was just very difficult to parse that out. So, um, because there's so much local variation. In uh, giving an example, Richmond spends $1,000 more per pupil uh, than their surrounding localities. And they don't have better outcomes. So, you know, it, but what would happen if they didn't? Who knows? I'm, I'm just saying it gets, it gets very difficult when you start doing that broadly and then want to get, you know, um, make conclusions from that. I think you have to use your, I think you have to use common sense there in, 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 in that issue more. And now, like I said, this Maryland study it was a very comprehensive study. I would suggest, and I could send it to you guys if you want. It was done about, a, finished about a year ago. 
uh, and they did it based on um, statistical now professional judgment, best practices. They used different methods to come to their conclusions, but they used all three to, to, to do it. So, and like I said, they, they came up with really need to spend 30% more, you know, to try to close the achievement gap for those kids. That's about the best I can tell you. Well, thanks very much. Appreciate Thank all your time. You. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Very I think it's, it's 1022. Let's take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for the second item on our agenda. Oh. Worthwhile discussion that we just had, a presentation I should say, and I'm sure discussion will come out of that presentation. So now we are going to have the school board update on the FY 2019 operating budget and 2019 capital improvement plan. Uh, is there anybody at this point that needs to make any conflict of interest? statements, Ms. Cook. Madam Chair, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to just state that as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-2019 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in public interest. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will help. Is there anyone else? With that, I will turn, that, turn this over to you, though, to introduce <coughs> the budget. Yep. Um, before I uh, hand it over to Dr. Karen, I just wanted to let all of you know that she presented her budget to the school board uh, last month, and we have had one opportunity to discuss it. We will discuss it again later this month uh, and then adopt it this sometime this month to, to send it to you. So because of that, um, Dr. Heron is going to um, not really dive into the specifics of her budget proposal to the board, but talk about the big picture themes that informed it. So with that, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the superintendent's proposed budget focuses on, on two big priorities this year. One is, of course, fulfilling our vision to champion the success of all students as an inequity issue. And our number one priority is making sure that every single student has what he or she needs to be successful. This has led to some very specific staffing requests for this year. As Mr. Regimbal just mentioned, we are becoming a more diverse uh, population in Virginia, and that is the same of WJCC schools. And some of our sta staffing requests pertain directly to the needs of our diverse student body. Our second um, key priority is employee compensation. Again, Mr. Regibald has really set the stage for that this, this morning in terms of uh, teacher salaries uh, across the nation, and in particular in Virginia. If we attract and retain the best employees, uh, that's the most important thing because it's essential to be competitive with surrounding uh, school divisions. And attracting and retaining those employees is what makes us able to serve the needs of all of our students. Ms. Barnes, Chief Finan Financial Officer, is going to make the presentation this morning and I may jump in here and there at various slides as we move along and give you a high level overview of the proposed budget, really emphasizing the rationale for some of the proposed increases. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Thank you, Dr. Heron, and good morning. Good morning. This is simply a reminder that the state code at section 22.1-92 requires that the superintendent, with the approval of the school board, is to provide an estimate of the amount of money that's considered needed to support the public schools in the division, and that the budget must be set up for each major category, classification or category that's been set up by the Board of Education. This also reminds all that we've examined costs and determined the proper needs to support the schools and the school division. So this is just an overview of the factors that, that are driving our budget this year. So we'll address and speak to each one of them in this short presentation. Okay, as a bit of history, in fiscal year 2017, we began to rectify the issues that were created and compounded during the recession years when salaries were frozen and scales became compressed. The problems were and still are that the starting salaries were too low and the percentage between steps too great. So in fiscal 17, steps were realigned with the years of service and the plus 15 columns were eliminated from our scales. As the steps were approximately 2.5% apart, we adjusted them to an average 1.5% between steps. 
to begin resolving the issue created by frozen salary scales, uh, we increased the entry level salary by $1,200. So in a nutshell, we increased the starting salary, kept the upper salary steps relatively stable, and adjusted the steps in between to approximate 1.5% uh, intervals. Then for fiscal year 18, the scale did not change. We didn't adjust our starting teacher pay, nor did we provide for salary increases, only step increases, while our neighboring divisions provided 2% raises. And this shows where WJCC currently falls with regards to entry level teacher salaries compared to our regional and neighboring divisions. Well, I would like to make a comment at this time as well that obviously we're second to last in, in the region and uh, to attract mm -hmm. and keep quality staff as teacher shortages across the state of Virginia and the nation become more of an issue that is going to become more difficult for us to be competitive in the region. Uh, Gloucester next year because they are last in the region they're actually considering a, a proposing a four percent increase next year and all other systems currently are proposing a at least a two percent increase for salaries even at their entry level so this will go up for everybody that's ahead of us next year correct even more okay correct So we're proposing a $1,500 increase to our entry-level teacher's pay, as well as a step increase for our experienced teachers and an average 1.5% salary increase. And the placement of this chart, as Dr. Heron um, mentioned, that this takes into consideration that no one else is providing a salary increase. So Williamsburg James City County Public Schools contracted with the consulting firm Evergreen to conduct a compensation study for the division. The team analyzed the current condition of our administration and support salaries. They pulled in and compared our salaries to our peers and provided recommendations relating to our current scales. we hadn't had a compensation study done in several years and so we really wanted to do that market analysis of not just teacher positions but also administration and especially support positions as well because we wanted to come into this year's budget with with actual data to show exactly where we we are in terms of market value and above is a listing of the 21 peers that provided information that was used in the study So there were 65 benchmark classifications and as mentioned the 21 entities included as our market peers. And Evergreen found the overall division administrative and support salary ranges are 2.4% below the market average minimum across all survey job titles, 3.6% below the market midpoint average, and 4.3% below market average at, a ma at the maximum of the range. So this is the associated cost, what we're proposing in the, this year's budget, next year's budget, sorry. Uh, this is the associated cost for an average 3% increase for all employees, as well as the regrade of certain positions and an entry level adjustment for our teachers. If and I could, if I could mention just some of the positions that are being regraded are bus drivers, custodial workers, cafeteria staff, they will move up one grade. Uh, per the, the, the compensation study that we had uh, completed. So another area that we've experienced growth in is our special education student population. Over the last nine years, the population has grown by 213 students. Okay. Yeah, I need to slide the... Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> so and we've not only seen growth in the number of students, but also in their level of need, and we're legally required to provide the services that are prescribed in, in a student's IEP. And this shows our current caseload for our special education teachers. 
We currently have several teachers who have the maximum number of students allowed per standards of quality. And the standards of quality, as, as Mr. Regenbaugh um, emphasized, this is just the minimum standard. And so even to stay within the range of standards of quality, we are going to propose some additional special education teachers this year. This doesn't speak to the level of need of students or how those students are distributed within teacher caseload, but there are several classes that will not be within standards of quality if we don't add additional staff in this very specific area. So this slide, uh, it shows the increase of, of special ed students and staff by each year. And we've already identified an additional 43 students and uh, as of March, I'm sorry, yes, March 12th. So if you notice we added 3.5 teachers last year with 49 additional students. There are, I think, over 70 going through the eligibility process. And as Ms. Barnes said, we have 43 identified already. So we are adding more students again next year. We do have over 13% of our students are in special education. It is high compared to the region. Part of the reason I believe we end up, we have a higher percentage is because our program is very strong and a lot of transient populations and military families choose to come here because of the services that we offer. So there's a good side and a downside to, to being uh, good at what you do in this area. And this is just how we compare to surrounding localities with the regards to teacher-student ratios. And the first column is the number of students with disabilities, the next, the number of special education teachers, and the final, uh, the teacher per student ratio. And just to note, as, as Dr. Heron alluded to, uh, this only takes into consideration the number of students per teacher and doesn't consider the degree or type of disability. And as you can see, our teachers have a higher ratio, ratio than those of comparable localities. How is Rockingham as a comparison? The size of the division. Yeah, so we, we have uh, several comparisons that we use every year. We have peer comparisons that look at the makeup of divisions and size of divisions that we use when we, when we compare ourselves. And then we also compare ourselves within the region and this slide just captures a little bit of, of each of those peer comparisons that we use on a, on a regular basis to look at how we're doing across the board. The next area that we're going to examine is the English learner population. As you can see, WJCC's English learner population has grown quite significantly over the past eight years by 512 students. And while the, bless you, while the number of students enrolled in our schools has increased, the predominant enrollment by language has stayed pretty consistent, uh, with Spanish, Mandarin, and Arabic topping the list. But this slide is indicative of our diverse population. So while the standards of quality ratio represents the minimum number of ESL teachers required to provide services for our ELs, uh, staffing at this ratio doesn't take into consideration our students' needs for increased direct support. The Department of Defense Education Activity, or DODEA, has provided a method of weighting EL students based on the level of need for support, and some school divisions choose to use a level of need model to staff ESL teachers, weighting the level of support for those students. So for example, students that are ELP 1 are weighted 3 points, ELP 2 are weighted 2 points, ELP 3 and 4 are one point and monitored students are a half a point um, as they don't receive English learners language services. So our EL enrollment is currently 711 students and they're served by 12 ESL teachers. So using the DODEA level of need waiting method, our EL enrollment would actually be 1,014 students. If we applied the SOQ staffing ratio to WJCC's weighted EL enrollment number, which is a one to 59 ratio, it would require 17 ESL teachers, and we're proposing three additional ESL teachers. I think in a lot of areas, there's, there's a level of need, and our approach is to gradually move towards meeting the needs of students. 
when we look at a accreditation within our system and staying fully accredited, accredited, which is something we've had for the last 12 years, our biggest challenge is to meet the needs of our changing population of students. Um, we have students who come to us with very little English that we're trying to provide services for, and many students come without a strong background in content as well. So that's why we can, we're at a basic level, 1 to 59, we're meeting that right now. If we don't get any more students with English language, uh, no English language next year, if we are to fully serve and to keep accreditation, we really believe we've got to reach a little bit deeper and meet students at their level of need. And this is one step towards it. So this slide simply shows how we compare to other similar school divisions in the state regarding our teacher-student ratios. If you notice, um, there's a little asterisk beside several. A lot of school systems have employed teacher assistants within the classroom to help with um, supporting uh, students, uh, EEL students. Looking at teachers, our ratio is right on standards of quality, which is not as, as good as some other systems. And we don't employ uh, teacher assistants right now. We would prefer to employ full-time teachers who can actually really teach the students in the classroom. So above is our current replacement bus replacement schedule. So. We've purchased buses this fiscal year with last year's year-end spending plan, which was approved by, by both governing bodies, and we hope to do so again at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, we currently have two buses in the proposed budget, which will keep us close to staying on track with our replacement cycle. You remember at the end of last year, we, we had uh, some funds that were going back to you, and we provided a, a year-end spending plan, and at that point, we were able to buy four buses in this year's allocation already, which was great, so thank you for enabling us to do that. Um, there may be an opportunity to, to buy more, we hope, at the end of this year, which is why we've just put two in the budget at this moment in time, even though the number is greater to stay on track. So here we've included a summary of the requests that are contained within our proposed budget. Uh, we're expecting an increase in the tuition for New Horizons Regional Education Center. Uh, we're anticipating additional expenses for the insurance, utilities, and custodial supplies at James Blair Middle School, as well as the additional staffing at the school. Uh, we've planned to purchase buses to continue with our bus replacement schedule. We've spoken regarding our needs to provide additional teachers for special education, ESL, and we've also reviewed and considered our en enrollment projections. We're anticipating an increase in the cost of special ed services of 131,000, and we're concerned with the safety and well-being of our students and are proposing the payment for staff members who would oversee the function of the metal detectors. And we're also hoping to, uh, proposing an establishment of additional precautions and uh, detection for concussions. And finally, we're proposing various solutions that will address other instructional needs at our schools. So as we look back over the past 10 years, you can see that as of September 30th, 2008, the division's enrollment was 10,248 students and has grown by 1,229 students as of September 30th, 2017 and we're expecting continued growth based on the future think low projection. And just to note, the most likely projection um, shows the division growing by 129 students. However, we use the low projection uh, in finance in determining our per pupil revenue from the state because we don't want to take the chance of, of overestimating uh, enrollment and risk the potential of a shortfall. So Austin mentioned that these enrollment numbers don't include preschool. So looking at the history of our state funding, we're looking back to 2009, and as we have in previous years, because that was the year that the recession made its initial impact, and until fiscal year 18, our funding was at a level that was less than that of 2009. 
Now the aggregate provides the appearance that the funding level has been restored, but by breaking it out by a rough average per pupil, we're receiving $314 less per pupil than we were in 2009. So the revenue has declined and we're also faced with additional mandates. Williamsburg James City County has been fortunate to have received increased enrollment, otherwise we'd be looking at even less state revenue. Uh, in fact, I pulled the DOE's calculation tool that incorporates Governor McAuliffe's uh, introduced budget, rather than just looking at the straight or rough estimate of an average 314 per pupil. And our, if our enrollment was 10,248 students as it was in 2009, our state revenue uh, for fiscal year 19 would be $29,818,266, which is almost $3 million less than it was in 2009. It's actually $2,967,279. Yes. Um, And this funding is based on, on what's been presented by Governor McAuliffe's introduced budget. And the House and Senate have provided their budget bills to one another with regards to WJCC. There's not much difference in the overall state funding. Uh, for our division, the total funding in the governor's budget lies in between that of the House and Senate versions, pretty much what Mr. Reg Regenbaugh was, was uh, indicating. Currently, we're looking at a potential increase in state revenue of $1,065,848. This is a summary of all the items we've included uh, regarding revenue. We've applied that from the governor's budget as well as that from the locality's projected budget. We've applied the total increase for instruction and transportation and the salaries and benefits lines to include the regrade an average 3% raise for all employees, an increase to the school board's portion of the health care contribution to offset the increase allowing the employees to absorb, to absorb their portion of the increase. Uh, we're also expecting, um, appreciating, or I'm sorry, we're also appreciating the decrease in the VRS rate reductions for the next biennium. We have offset the expenditures through light item reductions and after carefully reviewing individual lines, and comparing them to actuals while exploring cost-saving measures plus attrition savings. So this will leave us with a balanced budget. Madam Chair, that's our, our proposed budget. Sure. Um, I'd just like to interject that um, when the school board discussed um, Dr. Heron's proposed budget, um, they discussed, we discussed two additional items that weren't mentioned and just wanted to have you be aware of that. The first is possibly adding a position in finance. Um, a couple of years ago, our division switched to a new, uh, converted to a new financial system, and then during that conversion, um, switched to paying all employees once a month. Previously, um, bus drivers, um, cafeteria workers, custodians who sometimes receive su supplemental pay, got that supplemental pay a second time a month, and that went away. Mm -hmm. Um, we have since heard from those employees and it's negatively impacting their ability to uh, manage their finances be because in part their tax bill is higher and even though they'll get a refund at the end um, because of the way that monthly pay works, um, it's, a, it's a loss in, in the month for some people. And so we are exploring the idea of adding a finance person to, al to allow the opportunity to pay those employees twice a month because of the extra manpower that that takes. Ms. Barnes, please correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're correct. In fact, at the time, I th they were accruing uh, 1,400 hours of overtime. Okay. That's it. And then the other item that the board asked uh, Dr. Heron and Ms. Barnes to provide information about was additional security guards in middle schools and elementary schools because currently we have security guards at high school only. So those are two additional items that the board may be considering for just for you to be aware. Uh, the one question I had was, uh, I guess, from the pay aspect that you were talking about a uh, uh, entry level increase of $1,500 and then a pay, was it 3%? That's correct. Okay. Um, how will uh, the um, cost of the VRS uh, affect that or will it, or, or medical in other words? Um, you know, when you take a look at a 3% and you offset by 
a couple, one, one and a half, two percent inflation, you know, so you just, it's a, a nominal amount. Is it going to be eaten up by additional medical costs to the uh, individual or? or uh, we, we've encompassed that in, in that figure that we gave you. We actually, we're, we will appreciate about a $496,000 savings in VRS. Okay. And we have calculated the new salaries based on the new okay. percentage. But is there an increase yes. in medical coverage for people? There, there yes. is a, an increase in medical coverage, and so some of that will be eaten up okay. by an increase in medical coverage. So what was, well, just a won't receive percentage that. increase in medical co cost for the individuals, roughly? Seven percent. Seven percent. Okay. Thank you. May I make a request for going forward, not necessarily this year, or unless it's easy to pull together, maybe <coughs> uh, share that with us. And that is, um, when we look at the uh, enrollment history, it would be helpful if there was an additional slide or appendix that had that enrollment history compared to the um, projections prior to getting that number, uh, low, medium, high, just so we get a sense of where the actual uh, enrollment lands compared to where it was projected over the years. Absolutely. I can tell you that we have been very, very close within 1% of low projections for the last at least seven years. Seven years. Yeah, I think that's important for the community to understand. Absolutely. Especially when, when we have to talk about uh, new facilities, which we're not at this moment. The other thing I wanted to ask is if some of the slides, two, um, two of them, where we did the comparisons between school districts had Rockingham. One of them had Augusta and Fauquier. It would be helpful to have a slide that has a consistent comparison set so that um, we can just see across the board and you know, you can put it at a different place in the slide, maybe a little bit lower, if you're, depending on the point you're trying to make, but having a consistent comparison set will be help to, helpful to me. Thank you. Can I, can I just um, uh, very slightly push back on, on the notion that we are fortunate to have had enrollment increases because it's brought additional state funding? Well. Um, I, I think that the, the question that we have to address is whether that state funding has, then requires even greater match by localities, and uh, um, uh, while you know, certainly we welcome all of our new students and their families, um, uh, it is not necessarily the case that uh, uh, those additional students are drawing in uh, lots of additional state monies that we would not um, uh, otherwise realize. <coughs> Okay, I'll throw out one more thing. Um, the three percent is across the board salary increase. It, it's an average salary increase. Uh, it's a one and a half percent uh, average for step increase for teachers, and then a one and a half percent average for the teachers as well, and then three percent average, three percent for all other positions. So support and administration would average three percent just by themselves. Yes, sir. Thank you. Question: The um, Forty-three thousand. That's a starting salary. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not the oh, base salary. Right. No, that's the starting salary. Okay, because I noticed some of the numbers were hiring four teachers at three hundred thousand. Right. So I just want to make sure that was clear that it's not a exactly. starting position. That's a higher. Yes. That sir. would be a higher position to start. It. Actually, after seeing Mr. Regenball's presentation, I, I looked up our average teacher salary. In fiscal year seventeen, it was fifty-three thousand eight hundred dollars. Uh, the average fiscal 18 salary is 52,350, and in this budget, the average fiscal year 19 salary is 53,29. I mean, 53,920. So our comparisons are just starting salaries that we are comparing to other localities. What they're starting a yes, teacher sir. at. Okay. Yes, sir. The um, school bus as well. I know school buses are always you always need a school bus, and. and um, have we looked at when we purchase these school buses, starting to put um, seat belts in the school buses as we're bringing on new school buses? I don't believe we've looked at that. Mr. Snipes, do you want to address that question about seat belts on buses? Thank you, sir. Mr. Snipes is wearing green today because yeah. he's 9% Irish, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> good afternoon, school board members. Uh, board and city council. Uh, no, we have not looked at that. It is not a requirement uh, as of yet to put school, uh, to put seat belts in school buses. Um, there is, mul there are multiple um, ideas about there, out there about that. 
um, children having to unlatch seat belts in an emergency or someone on the bus having to unlatch the seat belts for the students. So there's, there's just uh, there's some pros and cons to that. And the right. cost involved would be considerable to retrofit the buses that we have, obviously. Right, I was thinking when we're bringing new buses on, I know with being fire and EMS, a safety belt has saved many a life. And um, it's something I think we need to start, you know, broaching that question and talking about it and, and uh, with our children. Because, you know, you see um, buses going down the road, with kids moving back and forth. And we all did it in school, too. I mean, it's just something that happens. Yes. But, um, you know, I think um, it, it would be some. It would be nice to know if we do buy a new bus and put a seat belt in it, what the cost would be for the added on to the new bus purchase. We can provide you with that, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Madam Chair, I wanted to speak to, I think, maybe the point that Mayor Freeland was making with a 3% increase salary increase. So for those positions that are regraded, um, their um, percent is, will be significantly higher, as much as 10%. So for the bus drivers and custodians and, and cafeteria workers. Um, and then I just wanted to echo again, um, thank you to our funding partners for, for um, meeting, trying, trying to meet the, the, the gap in funding from the state level. And so certainly revenue is an issue at the state level, at the local level. And the needs, the demographics on the ground are changing significantly. And so meeting the needs of our children with special needs and English language learners continues to increase. And, and this budget really is just baby steps to begin to meet those needs. Um, and so wanted to share a conversation that uh, the superintendent and um, Ms. Cook and I had with Senator Tommy Normant in, in January when we met with him um, during the legislative session, the tax, uh, tourism tax bill that he's proposing. Um, his thinking was that that additional flow through dollars could be earmarked for um, local school budgets. So that could be approximately $3 million annually in addition to and not to supplant additional funding. And so I know there's been lots of talk about that particular piece of legislation, but that is what Senator Norm Normant shared with the three of us when we met with him, that that was, that was his vision, that the additional flow through dollars would go back to the K-12 budget. Thank, thanks for sharing that information. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Me either. I know. That's why I shared it. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Well, uh, well, I also know that uh, uh, it's not included in the legislation because he's not uh, constitutionally permitted to do that. So. He shared that with us, too. <laughs> <laughs> Out of curiosity, you talk about new hires. Uh, on an average year, how many new hires do you have? And, uh, I think it's roughly about 100. 100. Uh, interestingly, and across the region, Many school systems weren't able to find to fill all of their positions this year. I know the larger school system started with vacant teacher positions. We were very fortunate, and I think it's because of our wonderful community that we still were able to be. I think we were one member staff short when we started school this year and then became fully staffed immediately afterwards. So we still attract good people to our school system, but we want to not have that change and we don't want to lose them. And I guess that speaks to retention uh, as well. Absolutely. Do we, we see the teachers tend to stay with us or they move on? We, we, have very, we don't have a high turnover rate, and I think part of that is because it's a, an excellent school system, and I think it's not just salaries, it's, it's our support of teachers within the system becomes very important in that equation. Good, thank you. to the CIP? Sure, I, okay. I'd just like to echo um, Ms. Ombi's thanks to both localities for filling the gap for so many years. Um, you know, it, it you've allowed us to, um, to still stay accredited and to do the best for children and we're, um, you know, meeting the needs of a diverse, an increasingly diverse population. I, I just want to build a little bit on, you know, we have a, a, a bus replacement plan that you've seen for many years and we've had to adjust in good years and bad years and I think we started at eight and eight a year and then we went to nine and I think we're at ten a year now um, because of the to smooth the the replacement process but I think also looking at salaries and 
paying our, our employees to retain the best so that our, our students can continue to achieve at high levels. I think that's a long-term um, uh, look, and, and I think the same is true for meeting the needs of our free and reduced lunch students, our special ed students, our English language learners. Those numbers are going to continue to increase, and so are the behavioral health needs of our students. Some of our students can, cannot learn in the traditional environment and need alternative settings to fulfill their educational goals. So um, I don't see these challenges going away, and I see them compounding year over year. Um, Ms. Good, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I had one other question before we move on to the other, and that I had forgotten about it. it was talking about your, uh, you said that potentially up to 10% for some of the regraded positions like bus drivers and, and custodial and stuff. Uh, bus drivers were, I guess, a, a particular problem <coughs> this last year or so. You have had uh, vacancies and stuff. Um, were you still operating those this year with uh, understaffed and, and I believe we are now fully staffed. Uh, Mr. Baker, if you would let us know where we are in bus drivers or, or Mr. Snipes. We uh, have an ongoing losing some through retirement, and okay. uh, but we're constantly, we've been bringing bus okay. drivers on every month. We're very close. I think we're still a few short. Okay. okay. But that you're better off than we were when you started the year? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, very so, much okay. so. So you think this would will, will help your... I think it will make Problem. us much, much more, more competitive, competitive okay. in, in the region for Thank sure. You. I, I, I apologize for that. Yeah, thanks, sir. <clears throat> I, I did have, I just wanted to follow up one question, sorry. Um, so you brought up that you all are looking at um, security and remind me of what the other thing was, I'm sorry. Okay. A finance position. To finance, with that, pay, yeah. okay. So had you all discussed any or have you gotten into what you would be taking away, or are you looking at adding two? We haven't had that discussion yet. We're waiting for numbers from Dr. Hale. Okay. Or one of them. We've got numbers for the finance piece, but sure. okay. not for the security guard piece. And then to follow up on Mr. Pond's question, I think, which I think it's it's great that we've we're, we're not having the turnover, but I guess if you could in in the coming um, years, you know. What we're hearing overall is that people are leaving the profession and not as many people are coming, going into it. And I know there's, there's been a bit, big discussion um, statewide, but if you could just kind of keep us updated on that. Sure. And then I know also or what I've seen through your following Mr. Baker on Twitter is that you seem to be making um, an effort or push to um, increase your minority um, That's correct. Teaching. Um, so at some point, maybe the school board could, could communicate to us what we could do um, in our role in our communities about um, making sure that this is a very attractive place to come to come work. I'm not looking for answers today, but just um, just how we could all work together. Absolutely. To I could I could add one detail on that. Mr. Regimble, Regimble mentioned that literally the number of people going into teacher uh, preparation courses at college, I think, has, has dropped significantly. So the number of teachers available in the future is, is going to become less. So it's not just a retention, it's actually getting good teachers in the first place. Now, I saw where there was a discussion on the state level about seeing how universities could step in to help that a little bit because a lot of these programs are five years which are great they walk out with a master's but still when you're looking at an increasing um, cost of education as a parent um, I, I'm living that all too well and you're talking about an extra year that's that's a lot of financial pressure as well and so has there been any um, strides there on uh, yet or is there still a conversation that's going on between higher ed and and the state board yeah I think this there's a lot of conversation around the certification of teachers and how often they have to recertify and um, education courses within universities being four-year rather than five-year courses okay. but I mean we definitely we want, we're going to maintain that quality but just making sure Absolutely. that everybody's working together okay thank you can I make a comment? Um, one of the things that, uh, and, and this is uh, generally more in a rural school district, especially up in the Northern Neck, 
um, is some of the community colleges up there are working with local school districts to uh, home grow their own teachers. And they, they, they come into the high school, they try to identify students who um, have the potential or are, are interested in becoming teachers. Um, and um, they, I, 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 I'm not sure, but I, I don't know much about the costs associated with that, but trying to keep the students in the community. Um, and um, it, it's something, um, you know, other districts are, are, are trying to do, and it's something that we, you know, we have, uh, we have Thomas Nelson, you know, right up the street, uh, there, that might be something uh, to consider, and also we have William & Mary's programs as well, but, um, but we're really going into our own high schools and uh, try, trying to see what, what interest there is in, uh, in students there uh, mm -hmm. considering um, pursuing a career in, uh, in teaching. So what they do. Um, next year we are offering a, a course at the high school level called Future Teachers of Virginia. Yeah. And we don't know what the interest will, will be from students. Any teacher can teach it, but we're actually implementing that next year as a way to begin to grow our own. Also, we've, we're working in partnership with William and Mary. They have a Trips to Teachers um, program, and I know we're in contact with them and trying to be part of that conversation as well. Madam Chair, if I could just a couple follow-up um, items. When the superintendent and Ms. Cook and I met with uh, our, our delegates, General Assembly delegates, um, uh, Delegate Mullen did mention, that, and I'm not sure how, what, how this legislation panned out, but one of the issues in Virginia was that in order to become a teacher, it's a, essentially a double major um, at the elementary level. Um, and so there was legislation um, that yeah. was pre presented to look at um, allowing um, education to be a, a standalone major. Right. And I'm not sure how that fell out. That, it, that, that does make it tough, particularly at William and Mary. Um, for students to, to enter the field because it's it's a double major. Um, and then again, to thank, to thank our, our funding partners, again, I think the reason why we have not felt um, that the national trend of, of losing teachers is because we are a premier school division and people want to come to our, our school division um, and work for us where other communities are feeling the brunt of the teacher shortage. And so that really is just a, a thanks to our community for supporting us. Um, and then just in, in efforts to be transparent, um, while we have made some strides with um, recruiting uh, diverse teachers and teachers of, um, of color, we don't always do so well with regard to retaining. And so that's an area for us to grow. Um, and so while we recruit some, we lose some each year. And so the net result is not as much as we would like. But it's still a net positive every year. It is net positive. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Capital improvement. Yeah. So mm -hmm. moving on to the capital improvement plan, you all got uh, that, copies of that, um, I think in January this year, and but just in the interest of for the listen, view, listening and viewing public, um, wanted to highlight that in the fiscal year 19 request, there was no uh, request for design of new uh, additional uh, academic learning space at the high school or elementary school level. Um, and don't want that to be misunderstood as a lack of need, but rather um, a, a wanting to circle back and making sure that the planning is inclusive. So with that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Heron to talk a little bit about her plans for the upcoming year with regard to CIP development. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on April 26th, we're going to be launching a long range facilities planning committee, which will include representation from James City County and from the city of Williamsburg. And the group will also include parent and community partners and representatives as well as uh, district personnel. The purpose is to thoroughly review facility needs and the, the timing of those needs with input with everyone at the table and to make recommendations to, to the school board. And that whole process is intended to really go a lot deeper than we have done in the past and then that will inform the capital improvement plan that the board will adopt and then send to you next year. One of the first priorities will, of course, will be to look at high school space, whatever direction that goes. Uh, however, the intent is to look at all space and really take a long-term and comprehensive view of the division's capital needs. I really feel it'll strengthen our process and it'll also open up the lines of communication and make them much more open as well. And that, that starts on April 26th. 
Uh, one other quick thing on, on the capital improvement. Obviously, you've noticed if you've been driving by Blair that our school <coughs> is, is well on the way. Thank you for, for your funding of that. Um, it, we are on time. We are within budget right now. And as soon as we have a date for ribbon cutting, you'll be the, the first to know, but we project it will be late August. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Going towards a no surprises approach. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you really mean that when you said on budget for now? I mean, do you have any <laughs> expectations? <laughs> I thought that too, Mayor. Mm -hmm. there, there are always unexpected in construction, as we are well aware, and that usually a lot of that comes in the surrounding land. So we have, uh, we have a few months to, to go yet, but we're, we're doing reasonably well right now. I could have used your help on my project, my renovating my bathroom. <laughs> my, my wife didn't, didn't make budget. <laughs> That tends to be the case, sir. Um, well, yeah, I, one thing I'd just like to add, you, that you, when you said, is there anything that the localities can do to help, um, you know, with retaining a diverse workforce? Uh, this has nothing to do with that, but we uh, recently, the school board went through a redistricting uh, process, which I don't think anyone on the board would be keen on doing anytime again soon. Um, but I do think if we start to build new space or if our... Um, where our student of our enrollment doesn't match our projections and there's imbalances between schools it's something that we may have to visit um, you know not next year and maybe not the year after but you know three four five six years uh, depending on what what is in the capital improvement plan and one of the things that um, that I perceived in the process was that people really view there where they lived so closely to which particular school they were going to as opposed to the division as a whole and I don't know if there's anything that we can do as a community to communicate that this is not it's not a contract it's not it's not a guarantee and um, you know there are some localities that where you look on the uh, land use and either property information system where school particular schools are not listed for that very reason because it's dynamic and I anticipate that in our division at least in the next decade um, there will probably be at least one more rezoning so I just thought I would throw that out there for everyone's consideration because um, we, in a growing division there are no promises and I think we I, Mr. Kinsman and I did have that discussion during this process because it did come up but we went on and I think we went on York and it, it didn't say school but it said polling place which I think if the average person was looking they would probably go oh that's where I'm going to go to school so but we can continue that discussion uh, as to whether that's something that we want to continue for James City County um, I know the other thing that came up a lot was the realtor um, connection so I don't know what we can do the three of us, the three of these bodies, to to sort of open up some channels of communication with with the real estate community to say we've got three great high schools, fifteen great schools. I don't know, sixteen. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there's maybe something if we can all get together and host some sort of meetings or or take people out you know, uh, to, to meet, when add those to the tours that you've been doing, if we add a couple of realtors or, or something to kind of drive that point home as well, because I, I feel um, fairly confident in speaking for my colleagues now that I know that we always talk about our, our school's division as a whole and how, how great it is. And so um, just trying to find a, a better way to have that communication. So, but we will look into the other on the part of our, our county and have that discussion, so. any other business okay all right well seeing none I will adjourn may have a motion to adjourn uh, the James City County Board of Supervisors until 4 p.m. on March 27 2018 for our work session mr. Porter mr. McGlennon aye Ms. Sadler aye. mr. Hipple aye mr. Eisenhower aye. Ms. Larson aye we're adjourned a motion to adjourn the City Council mr. Mayor we adjourn second mr. Trivet Aye. 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 We are adjourned.
this uh, meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board is adjourned.